committee, good evening to all and uh, good to see you here today. Uh, this is a joint uh, event between Institute of uh, Mechanical Engineers and Institute of Marine Engineering Science and Technology. And welcome to the event. Today we have with us Andrew Mayers from Oilson Response Limited and Dave Brooks from St. Jules Limited. And they will be discussing with us on subsea well interventional capabilities and their experiences. A few words about the speakers. Andy Mayers has over 20 years experience in the oil and gas industry, predominantly on capital projects with a subsea focus. Andy has worked for design houses, consultancy companies, installation contractors, and most recently at Conoco Phillips before joining Oil Spill Response Limited in a global role as the Subsea Well Intervention Service Engineering Manager. David Brooks has over 45 years experience with over 30 years in offshore oil and gas. They have joined BP in 1980 and has a variety of and had a variety of roles in pipelines, chemicals, offshore engineering, and trolling, or different uh, functions actually. And he was a project manager for Phenomen Development, west of Shetland. And after leading BP's deep water R&D program, he became BP's first chief engineer for subsea and porting systems in 2006. He was closely involved with the joint industry project on subsea well intervention following BP's experience. And Dave is a chartered mechanical engineer, past president and honorary fellow of the Society of Underwater Technology, and honorary life member of the Pipeline Industries Guild. He's a past chair of the DOT conferences and co-chair of the OTC Brazil in the year 2011. He has several industry awards, including the UK Subsea Engineer of the Year in 2009. Let's welcome Andrew Mayers and David Brooks to deliver the presentation. Right, so I'm Dave Brooks and I'm going to talk about uh, the, uh, largely about the Macondo uh, oil, subsea oil spill and uh, the engineering associated to stop the spill. Uh, this really provides an introduction to the oil spill response company and they provide the subsea well intervention service. Uh, so this will give you a background as to why we have that service now. So these are some examples of uh, subsea uh, well blowouts. Historically if you look in Wikipedia there's been subsea well blowouts or, or, or subsea if you like and uh, releases to the sea about every other year since about 1965. Um, there's some big ones, Ixtoc, uh, there's about 3 million barrels in the Gulf of Mexico, that was a, a Pemex uh, fixed platform that uh, burnt and sank, uh, it took a long time to stop it. Actinia was a, a BP well at, uh, in Vietnam in about 150 meters of water. There actually they hit, uh, during the drilling phase, they hit a shallow gas pocket uh, relatively uh, close to the seabed that actually blew out a big hole in the seabed and an enormous amount of gas came up underneath the rig. It nearly sank it and it was a, a close run thing. And then one that's quite familiar to those in the industry is Mantara in the northwest of Australia and Timor Sea. Uh, that was particularly difficult to seal. It was a relatively shallow well, but it did cause a lot of uh, damage, uh, particularly the Timor Sea and the fishing uh, area around there. So we then move on to uh, a deep water horizon rig, uh, 20th of April. This was a major disaster for the industry. Um, it was uh, 11 people were killed, um, a very tragic event. I would say that this talk is going to be about the engineering that went into uh, understanding what had happened uh, on the seabed and the actions that BP took to actually stop the flow of oil. Uh, not a, so much about the to actually stop the flow well. I won't be talking about why it occurred. There's lots of books, papers, reports on that, both the technical and the managerial failures. And I won't be talking about all the oil spill uh, on the beaches and how effective that was. So um, this is a fairly short introduction focusing on just the engineering 
associated with how to stop the oil flow. So first of all, we've got to understand um, about marine uh, subsea well drilling systems. So I'll just spend a little bit of time um, explaining this, and that will explain, give you an idea as to what BP was faced with. First of all, um, the mobile offshore drilling rig unit, we see there on the, on the right hand side, uh, a drilling system has a, a drill, <coughs> a large marine drilling riser. It's about 20 inches in diameter. Uh, it's generally considered to be a non high pressure containing unit. Inside there runs the drill pipe. The drill pipe is hollow, it goes down to the seabed through the, uh, the seabed system, and uh, mud's pumped down through the center of the hollow drill pipe and comes back up through the outside of the drill pipe and inside the marine riser. Marine riser is tensioned uh, by a tensioning system, it's freestanding, and uh, quite often in deep water have buoyancy attached to it. And uh, it's got two uh, pipes on the outside called kill and choke lines. At the bottom of the marine riser, you have the, um, uh, the lower marine riser package. So on the seabed, there's a very large uh, foundation. Um, on top of that will be the wellhead system. And then drilling phase, you'll have a subsea blowout preventer called a BOP. That's split in two parts, the lower half and the upper part. Above that, there is a flex joint. And then there is a connection from the <coughs> flex joint to the marine riser. So that's the system that uh, was in operation at the point when the, the oil rig um, had a major disaster, it eventually went on fire and sank. So <coughs> BP was then found uh, two days later when they're looking at what's happened. This is what we found on the seabed. This is the sort of typical plot, um, uh, ROV picture. So on the left, you can see this mangled mess of a large uh, marine riser. Is there a point on this one? Can't see. Anyway, talk through it. Essentially, on the left-hand side, you can see um, a 20-inch pipe uh, bent over with the kill and choke lines on the outside. And on the right-hand side, you can see the top of the flex joint with these bent pipes uh, leaning, bent right over. The flex joint itself was bent over about five degrees, and that sits on top of the BOP. Uh, the marine riser then disappeared into the seabed about 500 meters away and then came out of the seabed again and it's pretty obvious there was actually oil leaking out of the cut end of the riser pipe. So the challenge then was to understand well, if we're going to stop this what's actually inside the riser, what's inside the BOP, why didn't the BOP work, um, where is the drill pipe because that's the big heavy thing that was still inside the, um, the uh, riser when it, uh, it failed. So we spent quite a long time looking at all the possible ways we could understand through diagnostics using a high strength gamma ray uh, plate system from uh, Woods Hole and uh, um, Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. The conventional flood event detection techniques and 3D photogrammetry trying to understand exactly what was, what was going on. At the same time the thing was leaking more and more. Eventually we had a leak on the top of the bend and um, it became obvious that we had to do something about it. So the first thing was to understand uh, if we could collect the oil through uh, some form of a dome. And I should explain that oil companies are uh, organized generally into a drilling and exploration department that actually drills holes and is responsible for that aspect. And the engineering department's facilities would come on, they connect up to it and produce the oil. So the drilling department came up with uh, a riser leak containment dome. It's a large 150 ton big capture dome which they stuck over the end of the leaking riser to capture the oil. Now, in practice, the oil had a high, very high gas content, and at this sort of um, um, depth, with the ambient temperature and pressure, as soon as it comes out of the uh, pipe, it then forms hydrates. And the, the and surprising thing about this was, as they lowered this dome over the oil spill, over the plume, the hydrates formed so quickly and hydrates are less, are more buoyant than uh, the seawater and its crystal structure, and the whole thing started to lose weight on the on the anchor downline, and it became obvious very quickly within another 10 minutes it would have become buoyant and then gone up through the vessels that were trying to uh, uh, deploy it. So that was abandoned very quickly. The next thing was the uh, drilling departments came up with, which is a dynamic top kill and junk shot. This is the classic way of uh, dealing with um, an oil spill, uh, a blown well. 
uh, is to actually use the kiln and choke lines to inject through a very large um, pumping operation <coughs> a heavy mud, which is called top kiln. Um, it's a drilling term, um, some of these terms unfortunately uh, we use a lot in the uh, press at the time, uh, but it is a standard technique. They then followed that after that, didn't really show much um, uh, advantage. The pressures were, went down, then they went up. And you're talking about using about 25 megawatts of pumping power to pump this stuff down. Then they use a junk shot, which is a bit like the massive rad weld approach. So it's lots of bits of stuff, golf balls, bits of plastic, bits of rubber, literally, which they pump with mud down it with the intention that uh, it actually will block a hole. Uh, and that has worked very well, particularly in the, in the, um, uh, the Gulf, uh, the uh, uh, Persian Gulf. Uh, they killed a lot of whales that way. But uh, that didn't work either. So then we're looking at, well, what can we do? So by that time, the uh, back of the riser was leaking very badly. Uh, we were under a lot of pressure from the government to do something. So we decided to cut the riser off to actually get at the top of the uh, at the top of the BOP at the flex joint. That was done with some very big um, uh, shears and I should explain also the first thing that was done was actually to inject dispersant around the wellhead. The dispersant enabled us to work on the surface of the uh, sea. Without the dispersant the fumes and the oil spill on the sea would have just been too much to actually get any vessel above it. It was about over 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, ambient air temperature and uh, it was a very difficult working environment. So we got rid of the riser and then we were faced with, well, what have we got then? We actually had a cut end and there was an attempt, um, partially successful, to actually start uh, sucking up the oil using a, a low pressure, virtually a, a, a zero um, containment installation system, uh, which is called a top hat. And that was put over the cut at the top of the riser and uh, we started sucking up oil that way with a large amount of um, hydrate inhibition. And we were recovering about 10,000 barrels a day through a, uh, a drill ship through using their well test system. Um, but it became apparent that that wasn't actually uh, handling all the flow rate. Um, we had to come up with something uh, more fundamental. We looked at separating the blur the blowout preventer. So if I, I go back quickly. Um, the blowout preventer is in two halves. This is a, a hydraulic latching system. Theoretically we could have unlatched it, pulled off the top half, put another top on. But we were never uh, sure as to what was across the BOP. Because if there'd been a drill pipe across there, we might have got it halfway off and it might have jammed, so we abandoned that idea. So we decided in the end to look at a, a radical way of actually putting a valve, an additional valve, on top of the flex joint. That in itself is uh, hazardous. To actually get a flange you can actually attach the um, system to, uh, we had to devise an awful lot of tooling to unbolt the old flange, carefully remove it, and then insert this large three round capping stack above the flex joint. Excuse me. Anyway, I think it should come this way. Yeah, okay. Ah, oh, I see, okay. Right. okay. <laughs> so uh, the capping stack effectively was just a big valve. Uh, it's, a lot of this terminology is, is from the drilling side. It's actually three uh, uh, valves in series. And around that uh, arrangement, we actually had tapping points for pressure, temperature, and offtakes, which enable us to uh, connect the system up to um, a hard, closed system for uh, FPSO recovery system. So that was installed after about 75 days. It was lowered on to the um, top of the flex joint. The flex joint had been reinforced to try and bring it more upright. Um, the whole system was carefully assessed for what was the maximum pressure it could take. And the concern here was with every uh, attempt to uh, shut in a, a flowing wellhead like this that's failed and downhole, is, is have you got integrity in the, in the tubular system? Have you got integrity in the, in the formation? The danger is, is you may close in the wellhead at the top and then the, the, the oil will simply seep out through the formation and come up through the seabed and you'll have a, a much worse problem. So we actually had a, a significant amount of effort looking at just what the risks were. We finally convinced ourselves and the government that we could actually close in the well through a, a, um, a calibrated choke system and we eventually did that after about 80 days, 83 days. It was then a fairly 
tense week uh, with the government watching the seabed through a variety of devices um, and uh, convincing ourselves that we actually had integrity. Prior to the actual um, uh, final shut-in, we had containment systems uh, developed which effectively were FPSOs developed in about 80 days from start of the project to actually being able to contain and collect the oil. And we did actually operate uh, for a day with the um, Helix producer uh, actually about 25,000 barrels a day through a, a closed system actually recovering the oil uh, without it uh, escaping at all into the oil uh, uh, system, into the sea uh, uh, completely. And we had backup plans to be able to have over 100,000 barrels a day of, eight, of FPSOs and an enormous number of projects on the road go there. So it's a very complex system, a very big response, over 5,000 vessels involved, uh, 200 aircraft, I think, and about 25 um, helicopters and the rest of fixed wing, and at the peak of the 46,000 personnel involved, so a massive, extremely expensive uh, operation. But uh, I would say that from the actual response perspective, and I was in the middle of it, while it was a tragedy, and we shouldn't get away from that, there were some really bad mistakes made, it was a major engineering achievement to be able to shut this off. Uh, we did actually um, beat through the system. We beat the, um, the um, relief wells by around about uh, two months. Uh, we did push out the limits for complex uh, simultaneous operations of ROVs. We had up to 16 ROVs at one point doing the final shutting and, and operating them for a, uh, what we called a high intensive immersive environment, the hive. Uh, pretty complicated stuff at the time. Uh, we had 19 major vessels operating within the 500 limit around the top of the wellhead system. You can see just the congestion there. And actually doing that day in 24-7, we had 500 uh, BP and uh, close contractors working on a 24-7 basis uh, around the engineering centre in Houston. An enormously complicated um, uh, feat to engineer and to uh, organise. So uh, that gives you a background as to why, following that, uh, first of all in the Gulf of Mexico and now internationally uh, the oil companies got together to form the subsea well response system and Andy's going to talk about that. Thanks Dave. <coughs> so my presentation this evening uh, I'm going to be giving a brief introduction um, about the industry response post uh, Macondo and Montara and other incidents an overview of the joint industry project, an overview of the, the Swiss, the subsea well intervention service, and a bit of uh, industry guidance and some of the documentation that's been issued from a uh, planning and preparedness perspective. Before we get started, OSRL, o Oil Spill Response Limited is the largest international uh, industry funded oil spill response consortium. It's owned by the major uh, oil companies um, through subscription services. Uh, the, the oil companies own us, their shareholders. It's uh, Oil Spill Response Limited is a response organization uh, and we're trained to respond uh, globally. Membership levels depend on uh, the amount of production associated with the, the, the subscriber. Um, and then there are, as part of that, a baseline service for traditional surface oil response, which uh, Dave touched on, and then supplementary services, which the, the subsea element is, is one of those. And the buzzwords, it's by industry for industry. We have, a, as you can see here, all companies that you would be aware of. Participant members are global coverage, uh, and associate members have uh, lower production or, or associated regional cover. So the response post, industry response post Macondo and Montara incidents uh, through IOGP, uh, there's a lot of acronyms, I do apologize. There was the Global Industry Response Group, or GERG, which looked at four pillars, prevention, intervention, oil spill response, and mutual aid. Prevention, there was a, a lot of work done on well engineering design, well operations and management. And from an intervention part, there was the subsea well response project, which is the, the focus of my presentation today. There's also a joint industry project with regards to traditional oil spill techniques, uh, and then mutual aid. As, as Dave mentioned, significant amount of uh, people required, 
in an incident for a sustained period of time. So mutual aid is important. From the intervention perspective, the Joint Industry Project was looking at source control equipment um, in order to make sure that equipment was available to industry to respond effectively globally. And that involved capping stacks, subsidy dispersing application containment systems, uh, etc. OSRL was selected by industry to be custodian of the equipment that was developed from the, the Joint Industry Project. So as it says at the top, the project was developed by the Joint Industry Project and, and, and handed over to OSRL to become the Subsea Well Intervention Service. There were four phases of the, of the project. The first phase was delivered uh, in 2012, which was the capping stacks, um, very similar to what uh, Dave was talking about, which was used with um, Combo. In 2013, it was the Subsea Incident Response Toolkits, uh, first intervention, first strike packages, uh, and containment system in 2015, followed by offset installation system uh, in 2018. Oil Spill Response Limited have four capping stacks within our uh, inventory. They are two are 15k rated, two are 10k rated. rated. The two 15k uh, caps are RAM based, 10k systems are valve based and they're strategically located globally in order to provide a, a rapid response. The subsea incident response toolkits, again, two kits, one located in Norway, one in Brazil, uh, and they're focused on the first activities that will be required in the event of an incident. And the containment system is located all over the globe. The main uh, limiting factor is the uh, flexibles, which have a, uh, a minimum bend radius, which means that you can't get them in an aircraft um, so they are positioned uh, in uh, Brazil, UK and Singapore. And the final part, as I say, was the offset installation equipment which came into, into service last year. So truly global coverage. Uh, the, if you see the, the orange markers, that's the subsea well intervention service bases. So we have a capping stack, one of the 15k stacks in Brazil, 15k stack in, stack in Norway, 10k stack in South Africa, 10k stack in Singapore, the OIE equipment is, is stored in uh, Trieste in, uh, in Italy, and the containment uh, system is all over globally. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the, uh, uh, the equipment. The first strike package, which will need to be mobilised rapidly uh, in an incident response, is termed a subsea incident response toolkit. Uh, it is uh, equipment that was developed from uh, Oceaneering. Uh, the first kit that is part of this is for site survey and debris clearance. So the tooling that would be required in order to assess the situation and clear away any of the debris which may be uh, in, the, in the location, incident location. The next package is the dispersant injection. We hold dispersant ones for the application subsea of the dispersant, the cold tubing termination heads, associated flexible jumpers, dispersant manifolds, etc., to be able to get the dispersant at the source in order to create a safer surface working conditions for response personnel uh, and also may enhance the uh, degradation of the oil. The final kit which is part of the, uh, the CERT equipment, is BOP intervention. Uh, ideally, um, you will be able to intervene with the BOP to force it closed um, prior to having to, having to mobilise any further equipment. Uh, but in the unlikely event that the rig uh, fails to close the BOP, we have the equipment, subsea accumulation, ROV mounted skids, etc., to be able to intervene uh, on the BOP. This equipment's all stored containerized, so it says it's rapid response and configured for rapid uh, mobilization globally. The next set of equipment is the capping stacks. We hold two types of capping stack within the, the inventory. The one on the right is the Osprey capping device, which is essentially a converted gas injection tree that's stored at one subsea facility. Uh, and is focused and ring fenced for the UKCS. And then we have the Swiss capping stacks, which the OEM is a company called Trendsetter from Houston, 
uh, and these are the capping stacks that we have uh, globally. Dimensionally, they're about four, four meters footprint, four meters square footprint, five meters tall, uh, and they range in a weight depending on the configuration, 80 to 90 odd tons. The principle of the capping stacks is the lessons learned from a condo. They are capable, as with the uh, <coughs> containment equipment, down to 3,000 meters water depth. There is a common platform, so there is inherent redundancy in the, uh, the service with regards to there being two, two 15K and two 10K capping stacks. But there's also interchangeability between the, uh, the systems as well. So the outer, uh, the connector, the, the spool, the diverter spool, and the legs are all rated for 15K. The difference is the, uh, the main bore, where a 10K is a, a dual seven and one sixteenth inch uh, gate valves on the main bore, uh, and the 15K is dual 18 and three quarter inch 15K PSI rated rounds. As, as was mentioned in the response uh, from a condo, this equipment is designed to be able to connect either at the wellhead, at the lower marine pack, or at the flex joint. Pressure and temperature is available through, the, uh, through sensors and monitoring on the equipment. There's a lot of ancillary equipment which is provided with the capping stacks. Of note is the subsea accumulation. The capping stacks can, you can see, are run uh, with equipment to, from which so to, where you can use either a construction vessel or from the rig. There are various adapters uh, in order to allow connection. Uh, to those, those three points I mentioned uh, earlier. One of the, uh, the challenges to industry is to, uh, to respond uh, more efficiently. Uh, and we, uh, in, we completed a project last year where we introduced an enhanced air freight capability for um, our capping stacks. The capping stacks are provided with containers so you could break them down to transport them via air. Um, however, we looked at a, an enhanced system for the Norway capping stack where minimal reconfiguration is required. Uh, we chartered an AN124 aircraft uh, and developed the skid with a uh, company in Switzerland called LNM and we demonstrated this with a full scale exercise last year. So if I can just click onto the next slide, hopefully the video works. That's the uh, Norway base. Uh, so we transported the cat by boat to here. Chartered a uh, AM124 F. Yeah, AM124 aircraft has the benefits of being able to self load and self unload, which means it lies on the infrastructure of the airport's destination. destination. That's the aircraft with the cap inside, but clearly there's no footage of the cap actually inside it. <laughs> but uh, I assure you, it was in there. So the next um, service, which is the, the second supplementary service, is the generic containment toolkit. Again, lessons learned from the incident in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this, think of this system as a uh, temporary pilot production system with the various components both on the surface uh, and subsea, which you can put together like a kit of Lego in order to be able to provide uh, the uh, response necessary if you need to flow. So this is in the unlikely event that the, you are not successful in being able to fully close in the well using the capping stack, uh, you can flow. There are three strings of, a, of this production system which are offered through uh, the service. Um, overall, 100,000 barrels a day, uh, so split between each of the, of the legs. And the idea being, again, these are the long lead items that are associated in order to be able to provide a rapid response and it's maximizing the use of the existing vessels uh, and equipment. So from a point of view of the subsea equipment, we hold flow spools, flets, CDAs, flying leads. So it's all the production and chemical injection that would be required 
in order to set up rapidly a uh, temporary production system. And you'll note the, uh, the flexibles down there which are provided by Wellstream. Um, and clearly, as I said, they're the limiting factor. They will be mobilized via sea and can't be transported via air. From a surface perspective, we have standard well test equipment essentially, but also incinerator, transfer pumps, um, surface coolers, uh, connectors, hose end valves, off marine offloading hoses. We store all this in order to be able to configure uh, the surface requirement in order to be able to flow uh, and burn off and capture uh, production. The final phase of the project was the uh, offset installation equipment. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the premise of the earlier phases of the project were all lessons learned from the Gulf of Mexico and other incidents where it was a deep water scenario. So the equipment's all rated for 3,000 meters waterbed. There was a challenge um, with regards to how industry response in how industry would respond in a shallow water scenario. Clearly, in a deep water scenario, there is more likely to be a vertical access window above the wellhead because there's the water depth in order for the plume to be moved by uh, the currents and environmental conditions. And in shallow water, it's more likely that the VOCs are going to be at the surface. So we say industry was challenged. There was a uh, design competition uh, and SIPEM uh, Sonsub won that competition uh, in order to design the equipment to be able to install capping stacks and complete other um, activities from a safe offset, to, so to remove the vessels and personnel from above the blowing out well. The rating of this equipment is from uh, 75 meters to 600 meters. So as I say, the design premise was that there would be 500 meters offset from the incident well, uh, the capability to lift subsea, uh, so to be able to, um, to lift the capping stacks into location, Clearly there needs to be some articulation, so 360 degrees and accommodate vertical wellhead misalignment um, and soft landing capability. The main component of the offset installation equipment is the carrier. Um, it's 236 tonnes in air. Uh, it's roughly 13 metres in height, 10 metres width and 13 metres length. Uh, there is uh, four buoyancy tanks controlled from the surface via an air supply system. There's a main frame, uh, the carbon joint, and you can see here circled uh, the capping stack. Inherently, there's 10 tons adjustable uh, buoyancy, net buoyancy uplift with the system, and that can be trimmed from the external buoyancy, which you can see on top of the uh, buoyancy modules. So a bit more into the detail, uh, there's, there's the main frame. So, seem to work. It's not a pointer, I have to talk around it. Uh, there's, there's the main frame, uh, cross beams, so all structural components. There are the, the mooring winches, which are positioned, which are used for positioning the carrier once in the, to, to its final location over the incident well location and connected to dead man anchors. You'll see that on some later slides. They're rated to 50 tons each. There are four pennant winches, which are for lifting operations when the carrier is being moved from the surface vessels to do more bulk uh, operations, lifting the DMAs, etc., into position. There's a mooring tensioning system, connector, as I say, between the, the carrier itself and the capping stack. We have the buoyancy modules and the carbon joint in order to be able to accommodate uh, the well misalignment. Air supply, as I said, is from the, from the surface to the buoyancy, um, but there's also control directly via ROV, by our IHPUs interfacing to the side of the, of the carrier itself. The iso isolated uh, hydraulic power units, we have two of these, um, and they are designed to be coupled with um, the majority of uh, ROV types to maximize availability, and they clearly provide the hydraulics, electrics, communications, etc., to the carrier itself, and they're a bespoke uh, uh, design. The airline system is uh, using traditional umbilicals, whip lines from the air surface supply, down through jumpers, along the seabed, to, uh, uh, through the whip line into the carrier itself. So you have to have the compressor spots, etc., on the vessel on the surface. This helps to maintain the exclusion zone. This is a photo from the, uh, 
uh, FAT, extended FAT, which was completed on the P side uh, at Cartubi's yard uh, in Trieste, and that's showing a dummy, a dummy capping stack connected to the connector, obviously being swung at, a, a, at a, an orientation. And there's the ability through the carbon joint to be able to rotate that through 360 degrees. So when you look at the activities associated with using the uh, offset installation equipment, you can see here on the video on the left, for the main, um, thanks for that, for the, the main activities, uh, two vessels uh, are, are utilised outside of the exclusion zone with wire, towing wire, uh, in order to be able to move the carrier, which has a, a drag chain uh, underneath, in order to counter uh, the buoyancy, uh, and the carrier is util utilised, you can see here on the right video, uh, animation in order to be able to move dead man anchors into close proximity around the incident well location. Once in the proximity of the well, you have triangulation in the base case with, with three dead man anchors. And you can see here uh, the carrier connected using the winch wires uh, in order to be able to position itself above uh, the OP and lower marine pack. Control of the carrier is via a dedicated uh, control system, containerized, for, again, for the back of the vessels. Um, oh, that's the wrong button. Uh, obviously, you can see here all the systems uh, for buoyancy, carrier positioning, uh, the winches, etc. Uh, there's a dedicated team of uh, personnel, SIPEM personnel, which are maintained on call and ready to operate this equipment in the un unlikely event that is required. Carrier navigation, uh, there are various modes from the control cabin. It can be uh, uh, operated manually. Um, there's also a semi-automatic mode where there's freezing uh, in the, uh, the, the Z-axis, moving in the, the XY, and then automatic, you can plug in into the system two coordinates and it will move from one coordinate to the other. Here's a video, which again gives a bit more uh, of an overview this is photos from the SIT uh, and FAT and build. So this is the build on the quay side uh, in Trieste. The carrier was moved via barge to Rieka for shallow water testing uh, and deployed uh, in that environment and demonstrated to be able to connect to a, uh, a, a wellhead which was <coughs> out of misalignment up to 10 degrees. So this is showing the uh, activities that would be required clearing the necessary corridors, overboarding the subsea equipment, spreading out the wire between the two vessels, the surface vessels, to be able to maintain the exclusion zone. So the global operations of moving the carrier from the, uh, the parking zones, deployment from the construction vessel to subsea, picking up the dead man anchors using the pennant winches, and then being able to move those through the corridors where the debris clearance has been completed to be able to locate them into the set locations. The carrier is then connected via ROV on the winch wires, on the mooring winches, in order to be able to allow the pennant winches to remove the LMRP, pick up the carrier, capping stack, sorry, uh, position it over the well, where there is centralization through the plume. What's found from tank testing is that once the flow from the plume goes through the equipment, it centralizes, uh, and then the carrier is released uh, from the capping stack. Some key things of note with regards to extents of the OSRL service. So as I said at the start of my presentation, we're custodian of this equipment for uh, industry, and we have defined barriers that of, of with regards to our primary responsibility. So we're responsible for maintaining the equipment, ensuring it is response ready at, uh, at all times. And in the event, the unlikely event of a mobilization, we will move it to the quayside prior to handover or at the uh, an airport if the equipment needs to be broken down an aircraft is going to be used as a form of uh, mobilization. Just finish off my presentation with, with where uh, the, the, the more uh, pressing issues are with the industry uh, currently and this is really now, now that there is this large stockpile of equipment globally 
the focus is, is, is on the ability to provide quality planning and preparedness in order to be able to demonstrate to regulation and regulators that you are prepared for the unlikely event of an incident. An IOGP report was uh, issued as guidance earlier this year to provide um, an oversight, an overview of what should be considered with regards to planning for subsea well intervention uh, events, looking at common, establishing common workflows and standard practice. So that is available to, to industry. As part of the JIP, there was a, a number of documents produced with regards to mission planning um, that needs to be considered with regards to pre-planning, but also in the unlikely event of an incident. And these are all offered um, as through the service to, to industry. My final slide is related to the Industry Global Subsidy Response Network. So as I've had on the slides previously, OSRL has a fixed remit with regards to being custodian of the equipment for industry. We are developing relationships with key contractors, there's three that are noted here, but more to be announced shortly, uh, in order to be able to bridge that uh, red line in order to be able to provide a comprehensive response uh, for industry. So working with key contractors within the industry in order to be able to not only plan and prepare for this unlikely event, but also in the event of a, of a mobilization and incident response, to be able to provide a comprehensive response. Because as we all know, and was demonstrated from Dave's earlier presentation, there will be significant resources, there will be numerous companies, contractors involved, both, both from a subsea source control perspective, but also from the OEMs of the equipment, installation contractors, um, etc. So that's the end of my presentation. Okay. So any questions? Any questions? Yeah. Dave can answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got a question there on that uh, the equipment. You, you said you, there's a handover of the equipment on the quayside or the airport or wherever. But presumably, the, the people that have been working with this stuff all the time actually operate it on site. That's why we have the relationships with the key contractors. So the OEM, Trendsetter for example, who look after and maintain and test and store the, you know, the capping stacks on our behalf, they are the likely person who will be involved in regards to deployment and operation in the field. So, so what do you mean by handover? Well the equipment is, is, is within the custody of OSRL. Prior to the point of a mobilisation, the equipment then becomes the subscriber's uh, equipment. There is custody transfer in the event of a mobilisation. But the so people it becomes that, the well owned, well incident owners. The, the, the people that are familiar with the equipment, that have built it, maintained it and so on, do they not go with the equipment? They would have to be in contract with the, the well incident okay, owner. Okay, that's really the, what, what yeah. I'm, I'm getting at. It was this yeah. handover bit. Of yeah. So we have, the, part of the, the, uh, the alliances that we have with the companies, so we have the ability to be able to directly through OSRL support our subscribers in the planning and preparedness perspective. Mm -hmm. And in the event of an incident, we have to turn key part of that contract between that contractor and the well incident owner, such that it is a smooth transition with the handover of the equipment. But the custody transfer is key. That provides the framework, um, no, no, you know, which is the lessons learned from, yeah. you know, from a condo and other incidents. Mm -hmm. You need an enormous organisation to apply it, not just, not just the capping stack, yeah. actually. The rest of the kit. No, no, I, that's, that's what I'm, I understand. That. So you yeah. need a framework of contractors, installation contractors, source control. It, you know, it's going to be fabrication yards. You know, the extent as Dave showed on his presentation is, is, is uh, you know, extensive. The, the, the capping stack itself. Does it not have any inbuilt guidance system? No cameras or anything. It's just no, remote no, from the, the ROVs and stuff. Yes, it's utilising ROV technology. Um, Clearly, as I said, there are, there's pressure and temperature uh, monitoring on it, but that will only be valid once it's you know latched uh, and connected. Mm. And now, from watching and seeing the activities, that's the importance of the, the first strike package in order to be able to get dispersant, etc., which will help yes. in regards to getting visibility in order to be able to complete those activities and running the cabin stacks. Mm. There's one question online. Um, with advances in marine autonomous systems, are there opportunities to improve or speed up any of the response stages or activities? Yes. Uh, so te clearly technology always moves on. 
There are various JIPs, for example, with regards to uh, dispersant monitoring, where AUVs are being utilised and people are working on schemes to employ that sort of technology. Um, as I say, the, this equipment was developed as lessons learned from a condo. You can see that there's there's not uh, you know a significant technology leap from the equipment that was used on the condo, but in the background, industry is working uh, in order you know with regulators etc. to improve technology. Ultimately, you want to remove people and assets from the danger. Yeah, on the condo, we did use some AUVs to do some remote monitoring in and around the field, specifically looking for. Um, well, breaches to the seabed, so we're looking for bubbles or seep from the seabed. And we used it also for uh, monitoring of the water column for a variety of stuff. That's good. Thanks. So we're by the industry standard. I think we use the Hoogan uh, AUV at the time. All right. Thank you. Oh, yes, I've got one. Go ahead. <laughs> um, you said the, uh, the OSRL is the custodian of this equipment and do you have your own warehouse to keep this equipment at different parts of the world yeah, for so the immediate response? Yes, yeah, so all of our bases, so if you take the capping stack bases for example, Brazil, uh, South Africa, Norway, Singapore, they're all dedicated bases to store this equipment, maintain the equipment, they all have direct keyside access. Um, the capping stacks are all stored, fully assembled, uh, and the basis for that is that the most likely mobilization method is going to be via sea. So you're going to get a vessel of opportunity uh, and offload the equipment from, the, from our facilities, from the quayside onto the vessel. In the event that uh, you know air mobilization is required, uh, we have the ability from Norway, you saw on the video, to be able to fly it with, with, uh, with minimal reconfiguration, or we provide all the containerization in order to be able to break them down fully. So you could break them down into containers and fly them in standard, you know, twenty foot containers. Who's but responsible for the maintenance of the equipment? We OSRLs, custodian of the equipment, are responsible and we use utilize the, the OEMs. So for example, trendsetter, oceaneering, uh, you know, the well stream, etc. for the uh, the maintenance of the of the equipment. I assume the cabin stack is for gas wells as well as oil? Yes. So for the shallow case, the offset, where you've got large plumes, what's the maximum diameter tested where they can translate the equipment and put it under the well? From a point of view of the, well, you the surface they have, plume? Yeah, um, so they are outside the boundary. I don't know the answer to that question. Well, we worked on the maximum safe distance was 500 yeah. meters. That was based on plume monitoring through the column and also was actually partly based on what is the capability of an ROV and a long tether because you've got to get ROVs and we did actually demonstrate an ROV will work up to 700 metres away with a tether at that sort of depth. So you can translate that equipment at 500 metres? Yeah. Yes, so you, the, the fact is you deploy it all subsea in a safe area and then you're utilising the carrier initially with, with surface vessels on wire to be able to move equipment into place and then once you're in close proximity to blowing out well you're utilising the winches on the on the dead man anchors to be able to move things with, with well, one, of the, yeah, one of the big challenges was uh, it was designed for you know reasonably high pressure gas wells as well and uh, the actual forces on the capping stack as it came in over the well blowing at full pressure was considerable and actually mo actually uh, modelling that was um, right to the limits of, um, of uh, the variety of different uh, models where you've used uh, uh, all the uh, standard models and then we actually tested it uh, with uh, simulation with oil with, with, with a variety of fluids including air at a test tank in um, Toulon and demonstrated it could be uh, stable. It was actually bobbing around but it was sufficiently stable that once you got it centralised over it actually stabilised down and then you push it down over the well but that was quite one of the surprising as a ripple yeah. as you come into the flume. Yeah. So with, with the equipment, for instance, capping or, or the, the OIE, you need to get it at the appropriate height within the plume for analysis, CFD analysis or, or what have you. And then as the, as the equipment moves in, there's an initial uh, wave which is demonstrated within the, the tank testing, but essentially it centralises itself once you have the through ball, once it's open, it centralises itself and it becomes uh, quite a stable platform. 
That's so quite a difficult modern exercise. Mm -hmm. So is it kept in position by means of the buoyancy and the winches, or is there also a mechanical connection at the bottom? Uh, the, 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 the OIE itself, when it's working with the, with, the, the, with the capping stack underneath, is working in close proximity on the winches with the buoyancy, so you have the upwards force on the pulling on the winches. So that's, that's how it's, it's operating in close proximity to the well. And when it's operating globally with larger movement, it's the control of the of the buoyancy and, and wire. There's no other connection. Simple third way to look at it is that's a large subsea crane. Yeah. Which is uh, guided the position using the pennant wires. It's, so it's, a, it's a very complicated piece of kit. We originally, my view when it came to the committee about the feasibility of it, I actually did not think it was feasible to do this. But. Um, why is a mine mine to the mine provided and we put it out of tender and eventually Snow Project came up with this this approach. I don't think they made any money out of it. But uh, yeah. but, uh, in the shallow water case, uh, I notice you're using there small arco handlers, okay, for maneuvering the equipment. High pressure well gas wells in the shallow water, the radius of the plume where the currents are generated, which they will affect the anchor handlers, the stability of the anchor mm. handlers, extend to about roughly 300 meters radius. Mm. So did you consider the effect of that on the stability of the vessel and how that's going to affect the operation? Uh, there was a lot of plume monitoring done. Um, it was, uh, from what I remember, all the monitoring suggested within 250 meters radius then we would not be affected by gas or reduction in buoyancy. The anchor handlers actually are just used to tow out the, initially to tow out the wire, they actually set the wire out. They then put the equipment on the sea bed and one of them acts as control. There's no actual sort of lifting of that oh, yeah, once they're in, in installed. So they could actually move farther out depending upon the limit of the ROV. Yeah. It That's was a concern at the time, particularly on um, downwind um, air, uh, gas concentration. There's a lot of crossover with sort of traditional subsea bundle technology with this as well. Yeah. You know, with the, with the buoyancy and being able to control it in the water column, mm. the drag chains being able to move in close proximity of the seabed. A few questions online. So similar to this, uh, do you develop system cap gas and condensate subsea well? System with cap the, 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 gas the, the, and the systems are all for oil and gas wells. Um, yes, of course, there are limitations which needs to be assessed when you complete your analysis from the, you know, the plume analysis. Um, but yes, the, the, the systems yeah. are designed for oil and gas wells. Then the next one, what is the minimum water depth limitation for off offset deployment? Well, the specification is the 75 meters minimum water depth. However, it's worth noting that the testing was completed in shallow water. The, the, the challenge becomes that the shallow water, you know, the shallow you go, the more that you're spreading out your, your uh, anchor, you know, uh -huh. a DMA pattern, so it's more challenging to be operating with your winch, you know, your wires. Yeah. Uh, they're no, they're quite tall, yeah. I think, so eventually they come close to the surface and yeah. surface action, the, water, uh, the uh, wave action becomes it's 13 better. meters high, so you can oh. have some, <laughs> some, some yeah. water. Okay, the next one, uh, in the event of a serious incident, is this equipment and service available to companies who may not be the subscribers? Well, it, there is provision, but it's very expensive. <laughs> uh, you know, this is a, uh, a service which has been funded by, you know, originally by, by nine major oil companies. Um, it is offered with subscription service to the industry. Um, it is recognized that, that, uh, that people may not meet that criteria. Um, but access to it without subscription is very expensive. Costs about 600 million. And uh, the one thing nobody's ever asked, uh, which is uh, um, since 2011 and 12, there have been very few incidents. So the equipment, as we suspected, predicted, had never ever been used. And that is a major factor because then, as uh, and you said to some people, you know, it's about do and still keep paying for it. Yeah. But just to be able to, to clarify that, that comment further, 
in order to be able to get access to the supplementary services, you have to be a subscriber of OSRL. Yeah. So there is a prerequisite prior to, to any other uh, access, and ultimately everything would be down to discretion, etc. Yeah. That's right. Any more questions? No, oh, right there. Are there any um, synergies with other repair areas? There's a bit more of a broader question. So let's say, for example, EPRS. I know there's the Pipeline Repair Club. Is there any aspirations to globally support that as part of OSRL? No, not through OSRL currently. No. Okay. One reason why Stan got it was because of their involvement with the Pipeline Repair Club. Mm -hmm. You know, they were that they. Uh, when it came to the bid evaluation, they, you know, they took us to see some of the Trieste um, storage facilities they had. That uh, pipeline repair used for the um, med straight crossing. Yeah. yeah. Is that all? That's it. All right. So, okay. thanks very much, uh, Andy and Dave, for this very informative and lengthy presentation. And let's give a big round of applause to.